Child of Light is beguiling. It's not a word that gets applied to video games very often, but it's definitely the most appropriate one here. From its gorgeous watercolour visuals to its haunting orchestral score, to the fact that all the dialogue takes the form of an epic poem, it feels like a playable storybook from a different time. The game tells the story of the young Princess Aurora, and the story begins with her death. Here's Child of Light writer Jeffrey Yohalem to tell us more. The game begins with Aurora's death, and uh, she wakes up on an altar in a strange place. She thinks she's just been asleep, and uh, she believes she's in a dream, and the altar leads down to a dark forest, and she's creeping through the forest and getting more and more frightened, and then uh, encounters a firefly named Igniculus, who offers to lead her to the Lady of the Forest, who she believes will help her wake up from her dream. So, Aurora and Igniculus head out on their quest and take up more along the way, including helping a mouse woo his true love, and aiding a village whose population have been turned into crows by dark magic. As usual. Johanlan previously worked on Far Cry 3, which at first glance couldn't be more different to Child of Light. There are similarities though, and they line the fact that both games are coming-of-age stories. I think uh, you've hit on one similarity, which is that it is a coming-of-age story, but it's very different because for me, I base every story that I do on the rules of the game. Far Cry 3 was a cover shooter in an open world, and that story was about actually a, a meta commentary about uh, the player himself or herself and their relationship to reward systems in video games and whether a video game is something that you choose to play or whether it's sucking you in and using addiction to keep you playing. On the surface it was the story of Jason and his coming of age but it was all of these other things. Whereas uh, Child of Light is not about the problems of the industry, it's about Aurora growing up and also kind of the fragmented state of the world today. It's the game's presentation though that really catches the eye. First up there's the art style inspired by turn of the century storybook illustrations. We looked at a lot of turn of the century fairy tale art, turn of the 20th century uh, fairy tale art, like Edmund de Lac and um, uh, for me personally Gustave Doré. Yeah. Uh, his prints of fantastical events and you know we we're looking for dark uh, fairy tale paintings that inspired uh, people like Walt Disney, um, you know, the, the origins of that, the, before any of it was whitewashed or cleaned up for, uh, for children. Added to that is the fact that all the dialogue in the game takes the form of an epic poem, which must have been a massive hassle to write. Everything has to come in sets of two or more, because the rhyme scheme is an epic ballad, which is like A, B, C, B, where the second line rhymes with the fourth line and there's a set uh, meter, and also when you want to emphasize something, you have a couplet where two things rhyme. And so it was really uh, both exhaustingly difficult and, and exhilarating to deal with every situation in which Aurora or Nicholas could speak and then offsetting that with the rhyme. It's a longer script than Far Cry 3. So there's more... That was a long game. Yeah. This is a, this is a huge game. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, of conversation, but at the same time, um, the rhyming was the difficulty. If it all sounds a bit fond of itself, don't worry. The game pokes fun at this aspect through the character of Rubella the Jester, one of numerous party characters who join you along the way, who keeps setting up obvious rhymes only to use a different non-rhyming word which constantly enrages Igniculus. So the story's intriguing and it looks lovely, what's it actually like to play? Most of the time you'll be navigating around the world like a simple platformer, solving puzzles by pushing blocks and lighting things up using igniculus. Enemies are dotted throughout the world and if you bump into one the game will switch into battle mode. Approach them from behind and you can get the drop on them allowing you to start a fight with a surprise attack. Combat is turn based with an attack timeline at the bottom of the screen. Each combatant moves along the timeline at a different rate depending on their stats and once they reach the cast section of the timeline they're able to choose an attack to do, a spell to cast or to use an item. There's plenty of nuance to the system and tricks to give yourself an advantage. You can use igniculus to blind enemies which will slow down their progress along the timeline and the combat screen also contains bushes that he can shake to reveal health bonuses and magic boosts. If you manage to hit an enemy during their cast phase their attack is interrupted, setting them way back into the wait timeline. If you're good enough, you can stop your foe from ever being able to attack you by interrupting their attack every single time. Bit harder with more than one enemy though. It's like spinning plates trying to keep track of everything at once. 
I was never very good at spinning plates. As you win battles, you gain XP and level up, choosing perks for you and your team, and new abilities to give yourself an edge in battle. Certain enemies are weak to certain elements, so you can give yourself a big advantage by bearing this in mind, and by augmenting your weapons with things called oculi that give them elemental powers. So that's a quick look at Child of Light due out on Xbox 360 and Xbox One on the 30th of April. Be sure to hit like if you like this video and subscribe to Outside Xbox for more on the game when we get it. If there's anything else that you'd like to know, please leave us a note in the comments underneath. I mean, below. Sorry, Igniculus.